The joke is it's my movie. Can I ask everyone to please find a seat? We're going to start the program in just a moment. If everyone could please find a seat. Thank you. Good evening. Ooh, that worked. Good evening. I'm John Nico, the executive director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. It's my great honor to welcome you this evening to tonight's Jack Templeton Liberty Series. The Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia. We use this great history, the values, the principles of this wonderful institution, the Union League of Philadelphia, for all sorts of programs like tonight's uh, Liberty series program. I just want to highlight one of them because it just happened a few weeks ago. Uh, we awarded over $400,000 to Union League scholars and to employees' children, uh, children of employees. And they are wonderful citizens. In fact, they must be good citizens to receive the scholarship. So not only are they attending schools like MIT and Penn, 
uh, and going into automotive repair with a game plan that was presented at the, um, at the interview, uh, but they're good citizens. And that's what's most important about every, everything that we do. That's what we're about, creating better citizen leaders for tomorrow. So tonight's program, a few housekeeping items. One, if you would please silence your cell phones. We will have Q&A and we will have uh, that live, which means you'll have the opportunity to directly ask questions of our speaker. You all know the rules. Two, three sentences. If you can't put a, a, a question mark at the end of it, you have failed. And if you go beyond five, we may just cut you off. And I've assured our speaker that we will. And also please use the microphone. We are uh, streaming live. So we need you to use the microphone so that we can, uh, we can hear you. Uh, we have several upcoming events this summer. They're at all of the league locations, uh, UL National, Touristdale, Liberty Hill, and here, of course. There's one that is not in your program. We were just able last week uh, to secure Betsy DeVos as a speaker for June uh, 22nd. Uh, if you haven't signed up, I suggest you do that now. It will be a, a sold out program here in Lincoln Hall on June 22nd. And finally, I just wanna thank all of our donors uh, who have made all the things that we do possible. We are nearing the end of our fiscal and program year. We are just a little bit short of our $2 million goal for the year, and we need your help to get there. So if you haven't yet made a gift, please, please make a gift to the Legacy Foundation. Uh, we will put it to good use, I assure you. And now to introduce our program, the chair of the Union League Legacy Foundation, Ms. Joan Carter. Joan. Thank you, John. I am so happy to, to see so many of you here tonight for tonight's Liberty Series because the topic of tonight is truly fundamental to human freedom. It's one of the pillars that makes our country unique. And the topic is free speech. What's really scary is that freedom of speech is under attack from so many different venues. Uh, I don't think we've seen something like this in our lifetime. Uh, it's not just the vast government bureaucracy or the media, but it is actually business, uh, corporations, industry, and most certainly, of course, our colleges and universities. So to quote Benjamin Franklin, freedom of speech is a principal pillar of a free government. When this support is taken away, the constitution of a free society is dissolved and tyranny is erected on its ruins. So the left, what I call the woke industry, tries to convince people that speech is violence and needs to be controlled by government. No, it is not violence, it is speech. And without free speech, liberty cannot exist. So the left is organized. I mean, you've got to give them that. They, they do organize. And there are hundreds of organizations whose mission is to establish control of what we say and to whom we say it. But we're very lucky because in this particular topic, we have somebody on our side. We have an organization on our side. Uh, this is an organization of academics, professionals, lawyers, and they work at an organization called FIRE, which has recently changed the initials, the meaning of the initials, to Freedom Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. And they're based right here in Philadelphia. So Greg Lukianoff is the president and CEO of FIRE. He's an attorney, 
a New York Times bestselling author, executive producer of, <coughs> excuse me, Can We Take a Joke? It's a documentary that explores the collision between comedy, censorship, and the outraged culture. Uh, he's appeared before the Senate, the House of Representatives, testifying about free speech issues on America's campuses. So John and I are both very proud to support this organization. Uh, we believe that it is critical to individual liberty, and we're very grateful to have Greg here with us tonight. So please help me welcome Greg Lukianoff. Uh, thank you so much, Joan. It's really nice to be uh, back at the Union League. It's been a while since I spoke here. Um, you know, I was going to announce the end of the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, uh, but the beginning of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Uh, we were founded in 1999 by University of Penn uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, Alan Charles Kors, who you, you, you may know, and Harvey Silverglate, a uh, famous litigator um, from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and for since, 20, since uh, 1999, we've defended free speech on college campuses. Um, and we've, even though, you know, we didn't exactly solve the problem, we realized that if we wanted to save free speech on campus, we had to help try to save uh, free speech off campus. But if we want to continue to uh, help free speech off campus, we're going to have to continue to fight for free speech on campus as well. So education is gonna remain a major part of what we do, but as of 2020, we're the worst year I'd ever seen in my career for freedom of speech. Um, we, we realized that we had to expand beyond. And we, and we don't just talk about the first amendment, we talk about free speech culture. And we're trying to remind people that when you, when you look at polls, Americans believe in freedom of speech. Um, they believe it's a, it's, a, it's a fundamental value, but due to a relatively small minority of people that they're afraid will cancel them, they're afraid to say so. So what we're taking upon ourselves to do, we're doing a $75 million expansion. We, we have about 2.8, um, uh, 28.5, uh, goodness, uh, committed uh, so far. But a big, the biggest part of that is just to remind people why free speech is so important. So some of the content, this one, you know, we might act not actually end up showing on TV, for example. Um, it's one we're sort of workshopping at the moment, but this is the kind of thing that we want younger people to know. If I lived in China or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read, of the freedom of assembly, somewhere I read, of the freedom of speech, somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for rights. The thing is, younger people don't even know, they're not even taught that if they care about um, freedom of speech, uh, that they're in line with their heroes in the civil rights movement and the women's right, rights movement and the gay rights movement for that matter. And we're taking it upon ourselves to help educate them. Meanwhile, on campus, and this is what I mean by this has been um, a, a, a terrible couple of years. Um, I have seen, uh, we started doing a database because it's easier to keep track of professors than it is to keep track of students. students when students get canceled, it's much harder to um, you know, find the research. 605 scholars targeted since 2015. Uh, more than half of those just since 2020, that, that number gets worse every day. Almost two thirds result in sanction, one fifth result in termination, three fifths of them targeted from their left, a little over a third targeted from their right. The ones from the left are more likely to get them, them in trouble. 16% targeted from neither the right nor their left. There's a, I, I actually was surprised that number was kind of small. 60% uh, targeted for opinions, encouraging 21 for encouraging discussion, 24% for presenting a scientific argument. 
97 of the US news top uh, 100 schools have perpetuated some form of censorship since 2015. Um, if you count uh, a, a bias related incident programs, it's 100%. My alma mater, Stanford, uh, 20, Harvard, 15, uh, Georgetown, 13, account for, um, and, uh, and two thirds of these have occurred just since 2020. So keep in mind that, for example, other moments in American history, like the Hollywood Red Scare, that involved between 64 and 300 people. Um, uh, let's take Alien Sedition Act. Uh, what, I, what I was raised with was that it affected about 50 people um, were arrested for it. It actually looks like it was more like 150 people, um, that, because some of those cases involved multiple people being charged at the same time, with only a handful actually going to jail. And it's still rightfully a shameful moment in American history. Um, meanwhile, I'm talking about 600 just professors uh, targeted, you know, since uh, uh, since 2015, and I still have to put up with people saying stuff like this. If any other problem in social life was occurring at this frequency and at this scale, we would consider it effectively solved. Um, I'm the author of a book called Coddling of the American Mind with my friend Jonathan Haidt, um, and I was thinking about writing my sequel and calling it Gaslighting of the American Mind. Because at this point, if you're saying cancel culture isn't real, um, you're just really trying to make people think that they're crazy. Um, the evidence is overwhelming. So actually the next book that I'm working on is, called, is now officially called Canceling of the American Mind, just to put all of these arguments in one place and show how overwhelmingly strange what we've been through and continue to go through is and how unprecedented, how historic uh, it actually is. So this is something that I, I do, um, you know, if you'll indulge me a little bit, uh, when I talk to high school students, and I, I thought it might be fun to do with, with, with them all, and this is how basic. Now, so now I actually do it for college students because they don't know this stuff. Okay, how does mankind handle dissenters in history? Well, we sometimes make them take hemlock. We sometimes burn them at the stake. Does anybody know who this is? Not Joan of Arc, it's 1600. Giordano Bruno, um, who was executed by the, um, the uh, Roman Inquisition uh, for speculating on life and other worlds. I talk about we you know, burned to death our first Trekkie. And of course, when it comes to uh, sedition, people were punished um, all throughout history uh, for Roman history for that. This is actually an argument that um, John Stuart Mill made in his masterpiece, 1859 pointing out to, to have the guts to argue in 1859 against blasphemy laws to point out, oh, by the way, those were used against Socrates. Those were used against, uh, and one of the people who used them is your hero, Marcus Aurelius. Oh, and by the way, it was also used against someone you might've heard of, Jesus Christ. He was, he was a great arguer. So this is what I feel like students are taught today. Um, freedom of speech is really about. And, and I've gotten confirmation of this from talking to younger people. They're being told essentially that freedom of speech is the, uh, uh, is the argument of the bully, the bigot, and the robber baron. And this is wrong from stem to stern. I have to explain to them that, by the way, the rich people, the rich and powerful tend to do well in history because they're rich and powerful. A lot of uh, government came from kings uh, going to the merchant class and asking them for loans, essentially. And if the bully and the bigot have more than 50% of the vote in a democracy, they get to make the rules. So you literally, literally only need freedom of speech or the First Amendment to protect minority rights. And this is something that Ida B. Wells, uh, who's pictured here, John Lewis could have told you, Nelson Mandela did tell you, Mahatma Gandhi told you, Frederick Douglass, one of, one of the great thinkers, absolute brilliant writer, um, and uh, champion after, after champion. And the reason why it shifted so much on campuses is because they can't admit that they're in charge, that they're powerful, that they're hegemonic, that they are overwhelmingly ideologically similar. Um, and they don't wanna say that they have become, for lack of a better word, the man. And when you're powerful, when, you, when you're in charge, freedom of speech starts to look like a nuisance, something that has to be taken care of. But because they won't admit that they're powerful and they're acting like powerful institutions, they are miseducating an entire generation about this most important of rights. So what happened on campus? Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on this, but try to go through it somewhat quickly. Um, of course, political correctness is a part of this. Does so anybody remember the Jeremy Piven vehicle, uh, PCU? Good, it's not very good. But what it did demonstrate in 1994 was that political correctness had become a joke. 
um, that it was okay to laugh at it, um, this phenomenon on campus that really got going in say the mid eighties. Um, the problem with this though, is that after the speech codes were defeated the first time around, after uh, students started making fun of political correctness, uh, there was a sense that, thank goodness that's over. And what followed? 20 years of things getting quietly worse on campus. And, I, and I've been fighting that since 2001. And believe me, they, they were getting quietly worse. But at least we always had the students on our side up until 2013. And the whole idea that uh, if you talk to people who want to dismiss free speech on campus, they will immediately go to this idea that it's just like white rich bigots who benefit from freedom of speech. And meanwhile, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a bad argument to begin with. Um, but if you look at the actual cases that we have, they time and time again involve minorities getting in trouble for what they say or what they put on Instagram, for example. Um, this is a, uh, in, in the bottom corner there, that's a pharmacy student who was told that because she put uh, Cardi B songs on her Instagram, she couldn't graduate from pharmacy school. It was a, kind of a weird, weird idea, the idea that someone would decide not to work with a pharmacist because of their musical taste. So when it comes to administrators, um, this is a huge problem. And if, if I, one of the things that I want everybody to start saying to themselves, if we are actually talking about eliminating student debt, we should never consider that without a massive effort to decrease the, how expensive higher ed is. And where is that expense coming from? Overwhelmingly from the swelling ranks of administrators um, on campus. That's the group that has grown the most. That's the part that if you actually were to evaluate overhead at universities, um, you, you could probably guess it would be something like 80%. Now, what do these administrators do? Um, it, 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 they over bureaucratize. So these are free speech zones. The one in the, the little gazebo in the corner there, that was the Texas Tech University free speech gazebo. Uh, we worked out that if God forbid all 28,000 students at Texas Tech wanted to express themselves at the same time, you had to crush them down to the density of uranium 238. On the side there, this is the Blinn College one. Let's see if I can make this pointer work. This one, this sad little one over here. I just always include it because it makes me so sad because it's just these two squares here. Um, that's Blinn College in Texas. We defeated that one. This one, Texas, uh, this is University of Hawaii at Hilo. I, would, I took this picture myself, by the way. Um, and these were students who just wanted to hand out copies of the Constitution and protest NSA spying, not exactly radicals but they were told that they had to get into the free speech zone if they wanted to do it, something I literally would not step in because I was afraid I was gonna be electrocuted. So uh, the hyper bureaucratization, we've been able to fight this back. Um, oh, then of course, speech codes. Uh, this is one that, that is very relevant to uh, Philadelphia because this was one of the first speech codes de uh, defeated in 1990 at University of Connecticut, banning inappropriately directed laughter Inconsiderate jokes, anonymous notes, phone calls, etc. Drexel had this until 2006, until Fire pointed it out several years ago uh, and, and fought it. But what's funny about this is I don't even know how they could have found out about this ridiculous speech code without actually Googling most ridiculously unconstitutional speech code that ever existed. Uh, inappropriately directed laughter. It was it was something that was rightfully laughed out of court. And there is good news here. It, it's not all bad news. FIRE has been very effective in decreasing the number of speech codes on college campuses. Lots of lawsuits, lots of what we call the speech code of the month uh, to embarrass schools to get rid of these codes. But unfortunately, schools have found new mechanisms that are just barely constitutional in order to promote orthodoxy on campus, uh, including anonymous tip lines for uh, reporting your professor for saying offensive things. Um, my co-author, John Height, points out that at NYU, these, uh, uh, these flyers telling you to report your professors, you know, sometimes can be found in bathroom stalls put there by the administration. Um, it's gotten so much worse in such a short time on campus. Now, of course, the federal government plays a, plays a role in this. Um, some of the regulations that come out of the federal government are very, very uh, repressive. And someone who pointed this out, this is a liberal professor named Laura Kipnis. She wrote something about how Title IX, and this is completely true, by the way, um, is used and justified to, to uh, crush speech on campus. It's used as a justification for speech codes. Um, and she wrote an article about this at Northwestern University. Oh, and she was uh, found, uh, she was immediately investigated under Title IX. 
for her speech. <laughs> she was investigated for 72 days. She was told that she couldn't have a, uh, she couldn't have a lawyer present. She initially couldn't know who, who was charging her. She couldn't know who, uh, what precisely she was charged with or, or any of the details for it. And after 73 days, she took her, her story public. Um, and of course, as soon as she took it public, Northwestern suddenly discovered that, no, that actually isn't uh, harassment. That, that's, that her speech is not a Title IX issue. The horrifying thing of, of those 605 professors I talked about, it's, I can't include cases like Laura Kipnis because they don't go public usually. But I know these are happening because I've been talking to professors for years. So unfortunately, the situation um, is, on campus is worse than I thought. But like I said, we came to realize we can't save campus without saving uh, speech off campus and, and vice versa. So we have to expand. Uh, the professorate. So when it comes to professors, they, I actually have a lot of pity for them. D does anybody remember who this is? Yes, this is Melissa Click. This is the famous communications professor of all things, who when a student journalist wanted to cover the University of Missouri Mizzou um, protest, uh, this professor physically barred him at, while at, was saying, let's get some muscle over here to get rid of this, uh, this student journalist. Um, she, you know, was actually fired from her position and that was, in my opinion, quite appropriate. Um, communications professor trying to intimidate journalists is not a good look. Um, Dorian Abbott. Dorian Abbott, I finally got to have the pleasure of meeting Dorian. Uh, Dorian is a wonderful, brilliant, eccentric, fun fella. Um, he is a nerd's nerd. Uh, he was about, he was supposed to give a speech at MIT about the existence of more exoplanets, something that I would have been in line to attend sounds awesome. But he had written that summer an article arguing that maybe we should be promoting people by merit instead of the way we currently do it. And he was disinvited from MIT. Now, as far as we were concerned at FIRE, it's like, well, welcome to Wednesday. Like th th this happens to us all the time. This is a very normal happening on campus, but thankfully, partially because there are some new players in the space, this one got the kind of attention that I think all of these cases deserve. Um, and that really, uh, I think because it was happening at MIT, it really stuck, struck people. Um, and because it was about unrelated speech, it wasn't about something he said related to his field at all. Now, of course, we immediately pointed out there were at least two dozen other examples of other technology schools, including MIT, with, with, with incidents just like this. And of course, Ilya Shapiro. Um, so Ilya Shapiro, uh, was, uh, how many, I mean, I assume most of you know about this case, right? This is a case where a, a professor, um, a friend, uh, posted a, a tweet late at night um, where he used the phraseology, um, but alas, it doesn't fit in the latest intersectionality hierarchy, so we'll get the lesser black woman. Now, what he was saying in context, and by the way, he immediately deleted this and apologized, but what is he, what is he saying? He's saying that by saying this, this position on the Supreme Court can only go to a black woman, that you're actually undermining um, how seriously she will be taken. Uh, that was his point. And actually, who he's, re who he's recommending in, in his stead was an in Indian American uh, professor um, to be a Supreme Court justice. We fought with him um, on his side, I mean, for 122 days. We publicized this. We paid for his uh, lawyer during the entire thing. We were able to get the university. Uh, we, did, we did things. We we're constantly reminding the school of the fact that you still are doing this investigation of someone for speech that clearly by your policies is protected at Georgetown. Um, this guy, you cannot fire this person. And we kept a running clock for it. We kept on pointing out every time they passed some kind of um, uh, time frame, you know, saying that this is now taking longer than the moon mission, uh, for example. It took 122 days when all was said and done. Um, you know, we, we got a victory kind of from Georgetown where they said, well, since he actually technically wrote it five days before he started at, 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 um, at Georgetown, we can't actually fire him for it. And Ilya quit the next day. Uh, and it makes sense that he quit the next day because he had a target on his back. They were going to find something against him and saying that essentially he could be fired for saying anything like that. You can read his resignation letter on the FIRE website, um, if, if you'd like, but it is, it is really damning. Because he also points out other things that professors have said that are even more inflammatory, but if they have the right politics, they never get in trouble. Of course, my point is nobody should get in trouble, but pointing out the double standard uh, you know, is important. 
So oh, and this is a case that doesn't always come you know, from or for the left. Uh, this was one that got reported. Um, this was the way this was reported at, on some news sites. Uh, liberal professor tells Ayatollah of Iran where to attack in America. Um, and this was after uh, Trump was saying that he was open to attacking historical sites in Iran. Um, and this was a joke. I mean, he puts at the end the Kardashian residence, you know, like the Mall of America. He's making a joke that, you know, that he's basically picking on America for not really having cultural sites. Snobbery, kind of funny. Anything with the Kardashian residence is kind of. And he was fired um, immediately, and he still doesn't have a job. So, and fire is genuinely nonpartisan. We have people who actually vote for different people um, in the same office, which is kind of unheard of among, among nonprofits these days. Um, and except when I worked at the ACLU and that was, you know, you, you, if you voted for the different person, it was Democrat or Green Party. We actually have people who vote for, you know, Democrats and Republicans like within a given year. Um, so yeah, it, it doesn't all just come from the left. So, oh, and we just did a statement which you might wanna check out. The viewpoint diversity in higher ed is pathetic. Um, Harvard, for example, of its many professors has only about 3% of their professors self-describe as any kind of conservative, whether it's very conservative or somewhat or moderately so, 3%. Um, so the viewpoint diversity is already pretty low. Um, it's even worse in some cases in the University of California system. And in this case, the, um, uh, a lot of schools have started passing uh, diversity and inclusion statements um, saying you have to actually to even get a job here in the first place, you have to show your commitment to diversity and inclusion. And the idea that someone looked at the current uh, pr bodies of professors and said to themselves, oh, wow, there's just way too much heterodoxy here. There's way too much viewpoint diversity here. Um, that they're still going ahead with doing this is really kind of crazy. So we wrote a report about this. Um, it, it's a political litmus test, plain and simple, uh, in the schools that have it. What's worse about some of the versions of this is that it means that applications for uh, positions as professors, they go to human resources initially, and, it, and that administrators, ideological administrators, get to eliminate, call the pack before prof professors even see them. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more to do in higher ed. That's one of the reasons why, even though we're expanding off campus, we're actually planning to do more on campus as we grow as well. So off campus controversies. These, these are some of the things that made us decide that we really needed to do more off campus. And a lot of these are not about First Amendment. Um, I don't I actually don't think any of the, the, the upcoming ones I'm gonna, are about uh, First Amendment. They're about a culture of free speech and cultural threats to freedom of speech. So publishing. Um, this is American Dirt. This is a uh, Puerto Rican American uh, author who wrote an article, uh, wrote a book about um, uh, about a woman running from a, a, a drug cartel in Mexico. Um, there, was, it was so controversial. It was called racist and cultural appropriation, and, and that, that they threatened to take her our contract away. And eventually, there was enough support from people who actually read the book that that she kept it. Uh, I read the book myself. I mean, it's not really my cup of tea. It, it, it's a suspense um, a book, but it, it was a very thoughtful, uh, thoughtful take. Meanwhile, of course, Abigail Schreier, you know, writing about um, uh, writing about the danger of transitioning people, um, uh, tr transitioning, uh, uh, doing, giving people puberty blockers, for example, so they can tr transition from male to female or vice versa. Um, this is a book that. The American Association of Booksellers for Freedom of Speech sent to their subscribers um, to say, this is a, a book that people are trying to, to, to censor. And it was a, they, they immediately got backlash and they apologized to all of their uh, donors and said they apologized for the violence they had committed against them by sending them a unpopular book. Um, so watching this from an organization that I, I, I had previously respected was kind of a shock. There was actually an a, um, employee at the ACLU who said that he really wished that this book could be banned. Um, it, it, it's, so things, that's one of the reasons why we realized that we had to get in the fight here. Uh, Jordan Peterson, I put him on here uh, because um, I I've done a show, lovely conversation. Um, there were protests at his publisher in Canada um, when they found out that he was um, publishing, uh, that they were publishing a book by Jordan Peterson. Uh, apparently employees broke out in tears and, and wanted them to withdraw the contract from Jordan Peterson. 
this is also a shift that I'm not used to. Like the idea that publishing, it's not the idea that, that, that you're, you don't want someone else to read a book because you don't like it is, a, is an authoritarian, even totalitarian way of thinking about the world. Um, so, and, I, and unfortunately, I, I actually know somebody who wrote a book that was simply about free speech and was greeted with the same response, act, actual crying employees. Journalism. Um, as far, I had never seen anything like June and July of 2020. Um, you, you, you saw Matty Iglesias stepping down from Vox, citing um, a hostile environment for, you know, being a dissenter or, or disagreeing on anything. James Bennett fired from the New York Times, Barry Weiss, my friend, who I've known since she was 17, stepping down, um, citing the exact same climate, Glenn Greenwald, stepping down from The Intercept, which he helped found. Um, Andrew Sullivan, uh, who was one of the earliest bloggers, one of the most prominent ones in the world, uh, being forced out of NY Mag. And this all happened within a couple, within like six weeks of each other. Um, it was also at the same time, you have the Harper's Letter, 150 liberals saying that there was a cancel culture. They didn't use that term, but that's what they were saying. And even that gets dismissed. Again, this is the gaslighting the American mind because something really substantial has happened. And there's an impulse that essentially a relatively small number of people get to decide what the rest of us say, think, and read. Oh, and this is one that you guys probably remember since you're in Philly. This is the, the uh, reporter, the editor who I believe stepped down after saying buildings matter too, uh, because that was apparently insensitive to Black Lives Matter. This happened the same summer of 2020. It didn't, just didn't get quite as much coverage. Comedy, um, speech. Uh, we, did a, we did a documentary that I hope you all watch called Can We Take a Joke? Um, the argument there uh, was that Lenny Bruce would not stand a minute on the modern college campus. He was a profane you know, comedian. You know, I'm a big fan of his. Um, and the only problem with the movie is that we came out with it in 2015 uh, before this was on people's mind. We call it outrage culture because cancel culture hadn't been coined yet. Um, and just in the course of a couple of weeks, we've seen uh, comedians attacked for, for making jokes. This is, of course, the Will Smith situation at the, at, at, at the Grammys, Emmys, Oscars, I forget. Um, and to me, like one of the big things is, first of all, you shouldn't hit a comedian. But one thing that nobody commented on is like you also shouldn't hit someone who's half your size. <laughs> and of course, Dave Chappelle, you know, getting attacked and Dave Chappelle, you know, um, who's constantly they constantly want to cancel at Netflix and he continues being popular, well, you know, was attacked for one of his jokes. Um, and then he showed was a real class act. He actually wanted to talk to the guy who, who, who hit him. Uh, meanwhile, there were employees at Netflix who were once again, you know, uh, saying that they wanted to quit um, if they con con continued to host this very popular um, documentary, uh, sorry, the very popular comedy show. So how do we get here? And this is, this is gonna be a little bit more of a downer. Um, this is the picture that I had for the 2015 article I wrote with Jonathan Haidt called Coddling the American Mind. I've never been a huge fan of the title. I wanted to call it Arguing Towards Misery because my argument was essentially we're teaching a generation of people the habits of anxious and depressed people. So you should not be surprised that they end up being severely anxious and depressed. This is on us, we are doing this. And this comes from my own struggles with depression and anxiety. And the thing that, you know, and it's no exaggeration to say saved my life is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, yeah, I actually went through my darkest days in Philadelphia in 2007, I was hospitalized here. And I, while I was recovering, I was studying cognitive distortions. Um, and, I, and these are basically things that everybody's brain does, exaggerated ideas. Um, and so, catastrophizing is a classic. You know, let's say you go on a bad date, you come home and you look in the mirror and you say to yourself, I'm going to die alone, which all of us do in, in some way or shape or form. We all say exaggerated ne negative self-talk from time to time, but depressed and anxious people do this a lot more. Um, and what did that include in that statement that I just made? What, what is cognitive behavioral therapy? It's about looking at that thought and, and writing it down that this is catastrophizing, um, this is fortune telling. I don't actually really know that, <laughs> I don't know I'm gonna die alone. Uh, mind reading, you don't even know it necessarily was a bad day. Probably was, but you know, um, if you're feeling that way. But overgeneralizing, dichotomous thinking, emotional reasoning, all, all this stuff. And these are things that if you do them, you will be anxious uh, and depressed. So why are campuses teaching people to think this way? 
When I started uh, studying this in 2008, administrators seem to constantly be telling students, do overgeneralize, do catastrophize, do engage in mind reading, do engage in fortune telling. Um, and of course, uh, at the time I was like, okay, well, at least the students are rolling their eyes at it. Um, so far the students aren't buying the stuff. They're, they're acting like uh, young people usually do around authority. They just dismiss it. Um, and that's the way it was until late 2013, 2014. And the change was not subtle. It was like lightning struck. Suddenly students were demanding new speech codes. They were demanding disinvitations. They were demanding trigger warnings. They were demanding mi mi microaggressions. These are all terms I hadn't even heard uh, prior. And they were all grounded in the idea of medicalization. That essentially not this person can't speak on my campus because I don't like them and I don't like their politics, which is surely bad enough uh, on a campus. Um, but saying that this person can't speak on my campus because this will be medically harmful, usually not to me, they're usually saying some other group or other person on campus, sometimes undisclosed. And the reason why we wrote the original article was saying, oh my God, this is completely wrong. Um, they are, they've absorbed all these terrible lessons. They've, they've absorbed all these cognitive distortions. And not only is this a disaster for freedom of speech, this is a disaster for young people's mental health. So we wrote this in 2015. Um, it became the second most read feature story in the, in the, uh, uh, his, uh, in the history of the Atlantic up to that point. Um, and meanwhile, we thought we'd see a, a little scholarly dip um, in terms of mental health for young people. We, we, we thought we'd see some effect. We didn't expect it to be dramatic because generally in social science, offense, effects aren't all that dramatic. Um, I, oh, by the way, I wanted to call the book initially disempowered, um, and I do make the point. That's actually my son Max uh, to lighten it up, light, lighten up a little bit. That's uh, that's who I'm trying to get home to tonight. Um, that's uh, the. Uh, but what we mean by coddling, I always have to explain to the student. All we mean is that sometimes the things you do to help can actually harm. And unfortunately, our prediction that uh, depression rates would go up was um, it, the one thing we were wrong about was how much worse it was going to get. And it wasn't subtle. It was a disaster. Um, this is the in increase of depression rates. One thing that we found um, that uh, Height thinks kind of confirms my initial theory is that self-described very liberal women now report that 56% of them have been told by a doctor they have some sort of mental disorder. Um, that's to say, to say that's troubling is a massive understatement. And what I, what I, like I said, what I believe is this is coming from bad ideas they're getting from society, uh, not just on, on campus and beyond. Uh, suicides. Um, sometimes people will say, this isn't really happening. It's just students are more comfortable talking about being depressed or anxious. Um, students were pretty comfortable talking about being depressed and anxious in 2010. It wouldn't explain such a gigantic jump. Uh, and the thing that we had to show was that the, 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 the curves for uh, suicides were exactly the same. Uh, the male suicide rate uh, and the female suicide rate when it comes to attempts is actually much closer than it looks on the sign. Uh, just men tend to jump off buildings and shoot themselves. So they have a higher success rate uh, to, to morbidly, mor morbidly call it that. But even though that, that female suicide rate looks um, you know, not that bad, that's actually a doubling between 2008 and 2018. Um, and, uh, and when it comes to the spike that we saw, that line there is when 2018, when Coddling of the American Mind came out. And unfortunately, you know, almost all, every single trend we talked about in Coddling of the American Mind got worse. And this is the one that's hard, kind of hard to show. Um, 10 to 14. Uh, one of our big theories there is that uh, social media plays a big role. Paranoid parenting plays a big role, disempowering kids by telling them they'll never be okay if they hear things that hurt them, that uh, dis, uh, making them feel like their life will be over because they can't really handle life on their own is a very negative message uh, to send young people. So what does FIRE do? Uh, one thing that makes FIRE completely unique is we're not just a First Amendment shop. We're not just a free speech shop. Uh, we try to be creative in the way we reach things. I mentioned, can we take a joke? We have a comic book talking about freedom of speech. I'm writing a second one that's more superhero-y because I'm a nerd. We have a First Amendment library. Uh, we have First Amendment news. We do a podcast, uh, the Clear and Present Danger podcast, by the way, check it out. It's a history of freedom of speech globally. It points out how these things have been happening since the dawn of human history. Um, and, and they've been addressed sometimes quite poorly, sometimes quite well. 
Um, so we always try to be creative, try to figure out what's the thing that can actually get us in front of more people to make a strong argument for free speech. I sometimes call this tricking people into learning about freedom of speech. And this one, you know, as far as something that was fun to do, uh, my dad's Russian, uh, my grandfather fought the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, we lost. <laughs> But he went to Kiev Polytechnic uh, when he was a young man, and it was it filled me with great pride that we had rented a truck that was that, that was talking about freedom of speech, and it was showing images of, of protesters being arrested in Russia, and we parked it right in front of the Russian embassy, and nobody asked me to if I was happy with this. I felt like they gave it to me as a present, and I'm like, thank you, <laughs> thank you for pro protesting with the terrible things my people are currently doing. So in the book, we, we tried to describe this as, as if we're giving a generation terrible advice, um, at the worst possible advice, that we're telling them what doesn't kill you makes you weaker, always trust your feelings, terrible advice to begin with, and life is a bit battle between good people and evil people. Um, and even though the book has been successful, sold over half a million copies, still I feel like we're teaching uh, young people th these lessons and still worse. So in terms of what you can do to help, there are three things that we need. We of course need support. Uh, like I said, $28.5 million committed, but we're trying to get to 75 to do this massive campaign. Uh, we need all the help we can get. But we're also looking for plaintiffs. Um, we, when we started looking into if there was an unmet litigation need, um, we thought maybe there wouldn't be because there are still a lot of, of other organizations in this space. And we were slap, pleased slash horrified to discover that there were tons of unmet cases that should be litigated in the country. And that's just with one researcher looking into it. So if you hear about people whose free speech rights have been uh, abused off campus, in this case, we are usually talking about First Amendment rights because this is for litigation. We need more plaintiffs and talent. Um, you should Finding the best people and keeping them is the way you keep an organization healthy, strong, and, and ideologically um, uh, true to itself. So please let me know about talent that you may find. Um, this is a great quote from Fowler, uh, Fire co-founder, Alan Charles Coors, uh, which you know, literally speaks for itself. And here's my contact information. I'm excited to uh, take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we have a couple minutes for questions. I'm gonna ask Kristen and uh, Kira to uh, to give you a microphone, do we have questions? Oh, we have one. Yes, sir. Thank you. What responsibility do you think parents have in terms of knowingly sending their children to places, my own alma mater, Columbia, yeah. Harvard, U of P, in knowing that these places teaching their children ideologically to be contrary to what America stands for. Yeah. So, you know, as I said, I'm a, I'm a parent. Uh, my kids are um, four and six, thankfully, but I'm gonna you know, do my best to get this situation as fixed as I can by the time they're ready for college. Um, I do, uh, and, I, and I like the way you phrased the question. Um, I do think that people should be considering not sending their kids to a lot of these schools. I think we should be demanding that they massively de-bureaucratize. I think we should be supporting new institutions like University of Austin. I think we should be figuring out alternative ways for young people, uh, particularly young men who are increasingly not going to college because they find it just to be uh, not, you know, not for them. There, there's been a massive decrease in the number of young men going to college a, a very, um, and ways to show that they are hardworking, smart, educated, all these things to employers. The first person who can figure out how to tell a Silicon Valley company, you know, that this is the best, brightest, smartest, and hardest working person you're gonna find, who by the way, also actually knows things, is going to, you know, one, probably be rich, but two, actually finally get Yale, Harvard, uh, Princeton, Stanford to pay some attention. So I think there's complacency, which you point to, which has to stop. What's going on currently in higher education is not okay. It's just gonna keep getting more expensive. It's just gonna keep getting, have few, fewer and fewer free speech rights the way, uh, the way it's going. Uh, one thing that we recommend in the book is definitely, you know, having your kids do a gap year makes a big difference. Having them do something real before they go to college makes a big difference. It makes them less likely to be sort of brought into this stuff. 
as a testament to that, a lot of the cases we have are non-traditional age students who come in being told what, they're, what they can and can't say and are like, no way, buddy, I, I can say what I want. I, you know, I served in Iraq, you know, it, it is often like someone talking, talking about that. But I, I think that we're too complacent about the current situation in higher education. I don't think we should be looking for little changes around the edges. Um, I think we need some, a much bigger response. It's too expensive. It's not rigorous enough. I don't believe the one study that's been done on whether or not it improves critical thinking skills, the academically adrift study, which came out maybe more than 10 years ago, showed literally no improvement in cognitive, in critical thinking skills for about half of the students they surveyed. Now that's amazing because the, the range of the study was between 18 and 20. And I think if I'd stayed working at Burlington Coat Factory from 18 to 20, my, my critical thinking skills would have improved. Um, so they, they, they actually had to be holding them back um, from, from progressing anymore. So yeah, I, don't, I, I think working around the edges on this stuff is, is not okay, but you definitely should not be donating to your alma mater um, <laughs> without demanding that they get rid of their speech codes. Um, you should demand that they have a First Amendment um, uh, orientation. Um, but really, in a lot of cases, it's, you know, vote with your feet to a degree. There are going to be other institutions that employers are going to look at and go, wow, because like, I, I'm an employer, and this affects a lot of the way I think about this. Yes, if you went to a Harvard or a Yale or a Stanford, you are hardworking in high school, and you're probably pretty smart. And that is literally all it tells you. It doesn't tell you if they know how to write. It doesn't tell you if they understand statistics. It doesn't, mean, uh, doesn't say that they understand anything about law or regulation, anything about history, anything about society, anything about civics. It's amazing uh, that, that basically, like even going to a lot of these fancy schools, it literally gives you no content knowledge. Um, figuring out alternative ways to tell, tell employers that you're the real deal that are actually more serious and more rigorous than the current model could really change things for the better. But great question. Kira right here, and then we'll go over to Christian. Greg, thanks so much. I'm a Princeton alum and a professor at a local Ivy League institution, and I completely agree. That shall with, remain nameless. Completely agree with every, <laughs> everything you just said. Um, my, my Princeton classmate, who is a congressman in Washington, sent me an article by your co-author. I've read your book. I love it. Thank you. Uh, and I think it was called Why the Last Ten Years Were So Uniquely Stupid yes. by Jonathan Haidt in The Atlantic. Hi. Hi, sorry. And in that, my takeaway was he lays a lot of the blame with your line on a timeline with social media. And I'm wondering if you would agree and what can we do as people interested in changing the discourse mm -hmm. do about the challenge of social media? Now, it, I, I was really impressed by how, um, uh, how much coverage that, that article got because just like with Coddling the American Mind and, and John ran the article by me in advance, you know, I'm a big fan of Martin Gurry and I'm, I was glad to see that he was quoted in, in, in the article as well, um, that we also thought all this stuff was just common sense, you know, um, that essentially we saw, of course, you're going to have an anarchical crazy period when you go from millions of people being able to talk to each other directly to billions of people being able to talk to everyone. Uh, directly. That, that's a major shift. That, that's printing press level uh, change, change in society. So we do think social media is a big part of why the last 10 years has been so crazy. And I totally agree with them that it undermines the mechanisms that we use to be collectively intelligent. Therefore, when you get people actually withholding their knowledge, it makes you collectively dumb. It, it is to a large degree the, um, the, uh, the, 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 what the article is saying. Now, I do always want to be clear. We talk about you know, seven other factors in coddling the American mind. And I do think the way we educate people in K through 12 is a huge part of it. College is a huge part of it. And parenting also, like bad choices that parents make that actually disempower kids and make a big difference. But when it comes to social media, I think that, you know, if I had daughters, um, I would do my best to try to convince them to not be on social media until they were 16, 17, 18. Um, the amount of harm that it seems to produce is, uh, it, every study I've seen convinces me that this is, this is a real thing. And it makes sense. The idea of giving the worst tendencies of junior high school um, superpowers, uh, when, when I try to explain this to people who are skeptical, I'm kind of like, okay, imagine the worst of, of junior high school, 24 hours a day for the rest of your life. And I usually get shudders <laughs> from people. So I think that simple things like trying to keep people, you know, keep your young people off, off of it, um, 
Turns out video games aren't nearly as harmful. Uh, that's what boys tend to prefer. Um, it is a time waster, that's its biggest harm. Um, but when it comes to social media, I think that we're kind of, it's kind of like we're in, at 1521. Um, that's when Henry VIII started passing ordinances uh, regulating the printing press. That essentially there's no way that this period isn't going to be highly anarchical. It, that it's not going to be kind of crazy because we have this destabilizing, democratizing, um, uncontrollable technology that's changing everything. Uh, but we shouldn't lose hope that it could actually eventually result in something in the long run that could be much more positive. Having billions of people in the conversation shouldn't just be this ridiculous um, you know, substance free, you know, ad hominem attack fest. We can have hope that there's a way to do it that actually could bring people together, that actually could uh, actually produce wisdom, produce, uh, produce, even produce knowledge potentially. There, there is real potential there and we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't forget that. When it comes to the social media ones that seem to be the most harmful for young women, it does seem Instagram is the one that, that, that has the most evidence. Uh, Facebook even found it itself. Um, but I do think that we should be setting our sights higher for what potentially can be accomplished. But what am I doing? My kids haven't touched a tablet other than to watch one on long drives up to Maine. Um, like they, they don't, I'm, I'm keeping them off, off of it as long as possible. But I do think that thinking about ways that we can use this technological revolution for good rather than just ad hominem attacks is something that not only should happen, but I believe it will. Because one thing that does make me and Height a little different is I'm a little bit more libertarian than he is. And he sometimes sees a lot more top-down solutions. I see a lot more bottom-up solutions. I think that some of the trends that I see of, of my friends turning off their routers and making sure that all devices are off by seven o'clock at night for their kids, very healthy. Because one thing that was is, is hurting mental health is lack of sleep. And that's very clear from the, from the research. So there are cultural adaptations that have to happen when technology changes that I think we're still figuring out. But we have to think about both ways to change the technology, but also frankly, ways to change ourselves, our families and our own habits. Kristen. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, I wonder, you, you rightly speak a lot about the systems that are producing this, but maybe you could talk about the solutions to those who have already been through the system mm -hmm. and come out the other side. We see this in the employment market. Anyone who's employed anybody, you see it's already out there. Yeah. And, and maybe your libertarian roots point to a market-based solution, but how do you change those who have already been through a system that's broken? Well, man, there's a lot of things that people could do. Um, one thing that happened after I wrote Coddling the American Mind, everybody came to me in height and said, hi, I'm with giant business that employs many, many people, or hi, I'm a billionaire who you know, has a small business but still makes you know, tons of money. The people we're hiring from elite colleges are dysfunctional. Um, they show up and even relatively small negative interactions turns into things that literally will get work shut down as if it's, as if it's like something that really the entire uh, company has to, has to focus on. Um, and I, I hear this about even cause-based organizations being told that, uh, that actually there, there were direct service organizations that actually helped real people in the real world not being able to deliver services partially because everything turned into sort of like an, an internal focus sort of um, drama, so to speak. And I got, I've been told over and over again that uh, they won't hire people from the Ivy League. They won't hire people from the elite colleges. And I'm like, okay, do me a favor, say that to everyone so that they know that. Because I do think that Harvard, Princeton, Yale start realizing that they might actually be um, graduating people, Penn, uh, might be graduating people who are unhirable. Um, that might actually promote some, some real work. I do think that some of these alternative versions are gonna produce some really outside of the box thinkers. I think the first couple of classes of University of Austin are gonna be some super interesting people. Um, but I, there's Minerva College out in San Francisco that actually has a higher, um, uh, it has, it's more selective than even the most selective schools. It's extremely mentally intensive, not ideological at all. Uh, Thales College in, in North Carolina, you know, th there's a lot of experimentation going on. And I do think that there should be a lot more. But I do think that accepting college as it currently exists uh, is, is just a bad option. Um, it's only going to get more expensive. It's only going to take uh, to get more powerful. And unfortunately, it's, it seems to only get more illiberal. So I do think that sometimes simply saying, you know, I'm not giving to these schools anymore. I don't think anybody else should either, or I'm not hiring from these places anymore is something that if more people who thought it actually would say it out loud, it could actually promote some positive uh, change. One more question for Kieran. 
Thank you very much uh, for your for your presentation tonight. As a uh, a legacy fan, uh, Mr. Miko t tells us almost at every time what it is that we as Union League members support, and there are two things. And what are they, John? Every member shall support the Constitution of the United States and the free enterprise system. So, so given <laughs> so given those things, and a lot of us have maybe asked the same question in a different way, but with that in mind, yeah. You know, the Constitution suggests government action, and a lot of what we talked about is not government action tonight. Yep. And yet the free enterprise system where we're talking about private institutions who've imposed their own values uh, upon their business, so to speak, the business of their universities, their colleges, what have you. I was wondering if maybe you could answer maybe the same question that we're all asking, but within the context of that which we have all pledged loyalty to, mm -hmm how does this work and how do we work towards a better solution here within the context of not only supporting our constitution the first amendment which suggests this government action but also supporting private industry which gets to sort of do what they want without government interference yeah so are you saying i'm not totally sure i understand the question like are, are you asking for the top down sort of um federal government solution are you talking about the state solution are you talking about the i'm talking about the fire solution on out yeah that, that for for us leaving tonight as oh, union league God. members okay. who have this as our credo uh, we've heard some practical solutions yeah. but maybe with if you could answer that question through yeah. our own lens that we have here at the union league. well i might not get this entirely um Right, um, but I, I need your help because something is going on that might sound completely nuts to you. But I was even approached by someone at a very big company that's very influential saying, maybe we shouldn't use the words free speech anymore because those words have been tainted. Scared the hell out of me. Um, and the thing is, I think that she might be right. There's been a 40 year campaign on campus um, started by actual people to, uh, who, are, who are currently quite delighted that there is greater free speech um, skepticism than they have ever seen in their careers. And of course, you only have that kind of skepticism if you think you're the ones who are gonna be deciding who gets to talk. So what I wanna encourage you all to do is be unapologetically, unabashedly pro-free speech. Don't take the idea that you have to retreat from these terms. Tell your kids this. Tell your alma maters this. Demand that they have free speech orientations. Demand that they teach the philosophy of freedom of speech. Um, and if they don't, make sure that your kids don't go there. Um, this, like I said, this is not a time for, for small action. I think we need massive reform in K through 12. I think we need massive reform in higher education. And some of those are um, potentially uh, top-down solutions that could allow for greater competition, for example, I think could make, make, a, make a big difference. Um, I do think it's ridiculous that we're, we're like I said, considering um, uh, forgiving student loans at a, at a moment when, uh, without any idea of reducing the ridiculous bureaucratic load at these schools. So my thinking is, you know, sponsor debates, sponsor educational uh, programs, sponsor, you know, people re actually reading Frederick Douglass and John Stuart Mill, you know, think of uh, ways to get documentaries in front of people and talk about the fact that human, that freedom of speech has been one of the greatest uh, tools in human history for innovation, artistic expression, authenticity, and what doesn't get enough attention, peace. If we're allowed to argue things out with words, we do not argue things, we don't need to argue things out with swords. And what I fear is if we stop being able to argue things out with words, um, things go to go, go, go south real quick. So please be unapologetic defenders of freedom of speech, preach the gospel of freedom of speech, host debates, uh, listen to people you disagree with. There, there are ways to live this as a life philosophy that I believe a lot of people in this room do. So don't just practice it, and but practice it more, also preach it. Ladies and gentlemen, Greg Lukianoff. Greg, thank you. And I don't think you mentioned this, but if if you want to get an idea, there is a report card still, right? You have it fired up yeah. uh, org on a lots of many, most I think, yeah. colleges and universities across the country, and they grade free speech at colleges and universities. So go take a look at what Penn is and Drexel and your local it's, schools. It's even better now. Um, what, what we do is uh, a game changer was I now have researchers that work at FIRE that are able to poll students directly at schools. So with that additional data for the first time, it's rigorous enough because uh, I wouldn't allow it otherwise. 
to actually rank schools according to how good they are for freedom of speech. And the next ranking, we've tweaked the algorithm a little bit to try to make it more and more faithful to what, what people can actually expect there. And the next ranking, we're doing 200 schools. It costs about $8,000 to do a single school. We're doing, about, uh, two, we're doing about 200 schools. I would love to be able to get to 600, 700 at some point. Fire.org. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate you being here. Okay. We'll look forward to seeing everyone on June 22nd for Betsy DeVos. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening.